Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and may the fourth be with you. A very merry Star Wars day to all of you, wherever you are in the galaxy. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of the Shakespeare Deck, and this is a Quirk Books and the Show Must Go Online special presentation of selected scenes from Ian Desha's Shakespeare's Star Wars, Verily, A New Hope. This will be the first in a series of special broadcasts read live by a global cast on Monday nights. This time next week, we're thrilled to announce that we will be performing excerpts from Ian's latest work, The Taming of the Clueless. Tonight's excerpts of Shakespeare Star Wars will commence in approximately 10 minutes time. The show will last for approximately 40 minutes, after which we'll introduce you to the cast and crew, followed by a 20 minute Q&A with the author himself, Ian Desher and the team. In honour of Star Wars Day, all of Ian Desha's William Shakespeare Star Wars books are available for sale on quirkbooks.biz. And when you buy Ian's books from Quirk Shop, they'll give 30% of the profits to the show must go online. How's about that? Please get buying. Get one for your grandma as well. If this is your first time seeing a show must go online presentation, our self-isolated actors across the globe collaborate from their living rooms using ingenuity, resourcefulness and found items to bring to life the complete works of Shakespeare every Wednesday at 7pm over at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles. Whether you're a Shakespeare fan or you've never seen Shakespeare before, we'd love for you to join us for Comedy of Errors this Wednesday. For tonight's show, please capture your reactions using the hashtags Pop Shakespeare Live and Show Must Go Online. And be sure to follow us, Quirk Books, Ian Desha, and our cast and crew. Tonight's game is spot the references to other Shakespeare plays. At this time, to introduce our special presentation, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Mr. Steve Purcell. Steve Purcell is an Associate Professor of Shakespeare and Performance Studies at the University of Warwick and Joint Artistic Director of the Pantaloons Theatre Company. He is the author of several books on Shakespeare in performance, including Shakespeare and Audience Practice and Mark Rylance at the Globe. His <clears throat> Excuse me. His research interests include Shakespeare in popular culture, parody, adaptation and comedy, making him an ideal choice to introduce tonight's performance. Steve, the play is Shakespeare's Star Wars and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob, and thank you so much for having me. William Shakespeare's Star Wars. The hook is in the title. What could be more delightfully absurd? Star Wars in the style of Shakespeare, a massively popular science fiction movie franchise dressed up in the clothes of the ultimate icon of literary high culture. Like many great Shakespeare parodies, Ian Desha's Star Wars series derives its initial impact from what we perceive as its incongruity, a mashup of popular culture with high art. We can see it as being in a tradition that goes right back to the 17th century with Thomas Duffett's Mock Tempest, for example, resetting Shakespeare's magical drama into a prison for prostitutes, right through to the 21st century and Rick Miller's Mac Homer, which re-performs Macbeth in the voices of the Simpsons. Much of the humour of William Shakespeare's Star Wars derives from seeing the features of Shakespearean drama cropping up discordantly in George Lucas's galaxy far, far away. The whole script is written in iambic pentameter, the distinctive poetic meter that Shakespeare so often used, five heartbeats per line, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks, filling the dialogue with doths and thous and adding lots of extra syllables to words gives George Lucas's dialogue a comically Shakespearean gloss. We also get those classically Shakespearean conventions, asides and soliloquies in which characters break out of the fictional world to confide directly in the audience. Those of you who know your Shakespeare will recognise lots of familiar lines tonight, subtly and not so subtly transformed. Those of you who know your Star Wars will enjoy plenty of in-jokes too. On one level then, this is an affectionate send-up of both Star Wars and Shakespeare. The stormtroopers' uh, storm utter incompetence in locating the droids is mocked, for example, and at times we might get a sense that Shakespeare's taste for elaborate wordplay is being gently spoofed too. But many of the pleasures of this script come not from its incongruity or its satire, 
but actually from the unexpected harmonies it finds between Shakespeare and Star Wars. After all, Shakespeare was writing the pop culture of his day. So this script's use of a chorus figure, urging us to use our imaginations to see what cannot possibly, possibly be put on stage, is a nod to Henry V, perhaps also to Pericles, the only two plays in which Shakespeare uses such a figure regularly uh, throughout the text. I wonder if there's something in this. Of all Shakespeare's plays, the plot of Star Wars resembles most closely those of his early history plays, such as Henry V, and his late romances, like Pericles. Shakespeare loved multiple sequels, beginning his career, for example, with a trilogy of plays about Henry VI and the various wars and conflicts of his reign. He also knew the value of a good prequel trilogy, going on to write a three-play chronicle about the formative years of Henry VI's father, Henry V. In the opening moments of Kenneth Branagh's 1989 film version of Henry V, we see the young king enter the scene like a sort of Darth Vader, a cloaked shadowy figure silhouetted against a bright background marching in to ominous orchestral music. As the scene continues, his face is half in light, half in shadow, much as Luke Skywalker's is at the end of The Return of the Jedi when his father is trying to coax him over to the dark side. Over three plays, Shakespeare tells the tale of a young prince and subsequently king who finds himself torn between his own warring impulses, between his real and his adoptive fathers. When Ian Desher adds a couple of Henry V style speeches in which Luke rouses the rebel troops, spurring them to victory against overwhelming odds, his adaptation is more Shakespeare than Star Wars, those speeches have no counterparts in George Lucas's film. Towards the end of his career, Shakespeare started to write plots that anticipate other aspects of A New Hope. The Winter's Tale and Cymbeline, for example, include stories of young people growing up in a remote wilderness, tending the land, unaware that they're the long lost children of kings, their guardians keeping them in ignorance of their true natures. When these castaways are encountered by unsuspecting members of their own families, a plot device that also happens in Pericles, their relatives find themselves inexplicably drawn towards them, as Luke is to Leia in Desha's adaptation. The irony ringing loud for those of us in the audience, even though the characters themselves do not know it. Not even were she my sister could I know a duty of more weight than I feel now. There's a really lovely, clever moment at the beginning of Desha's Act Five in which Luke and Leia get alternating twin soliloquies, the form of the verse hinting at the as yet unrevealed kinship between the characters. As this suggests, the Shakespearean form allows Desha to make some really creative add-ons to George Lucas's storytelling. The use of soliloquies and asides, for example, tells us about character motivations that remain hidden in the original film, and which those of us who know the plots can only guess at as we rewatch the original. Why does Obi-Wan Kenobi keep Luke's parentage a secret? What lies behind the awakening of Han Solo's conscience, his arc from self-interested smuggler to hero of the rebellion? What's going on in R2-D2 circuitry and what might his internal monologue sound like? Desha's adaptation, part parody, part homage, allows us to glimpse inside their heads. Enjoy the show, and may the fourth be with you. Thank you so much for that, Steve. That was a fabulous introduction. Tonight's presentation, ladies and gentlemen, is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtags show must go online and pop Shakespeare live. And without further ado, it is my pleasure, honor and privilege to introduce to you William Shakespeare's Star Wars. La 
It is a period of civil war. The spaceships of the rebels, striking swift from base unseen, have gained a victory or the cruel galactic empire, now adrift. Amidst the battle, rebel spies prevailed and stole the plans to a space station vast, whose powerful beams will later be unveiled and crush a planet. Tis the Death Star blast. Pursued by agents sinister and cold, now Princess Leia to her home doth flee. Delivering plans and a new hope they hold of bringing freedom to the galaxy. In time so long ago begins our play in star-crossed galaxy far, far away. Act 1, Scene 1. Aboard the Rebel Ship. Enter C-3PO and R2-D2. Now is the summer of our happiness made winter by this sudden fierce attack. Our ship is under siege, I know not how. Oh, hast thou heard? The main reactor fails. We shall most surely be destroyed by this. I'll warrant madness lies herein. Beep beep. Beep 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 meep squeak. Beep 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 wee. We're doomed. The princess shall have no escape this time. I fear this battle doth portend the end of the rebellion. Oh, what misery! Pray, R2-D2, where art thou? Beep, beep. At last, where hast thou been? I fear they come in this direction. Pray, what shall we do? Oh, my circuitry o'erloads. My mind's o'erthrown. And fear hath put its grip into my wires. We shall be spent unto that place I dread. The castle's space mines whence no droid returns. And there be blasted into who knows what. Oh. Anon! Anon, R2, where dost thou go? Oh, prithee, patience, leave me not alone. I, even though I mock and injure thee, I'll surely die if e'er thou leavest me. Exeunt Droids Act 2, Scene 2, Inside the Kenobi Homestead Enter Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke Skywalker, C-3PO and R2-D2. Nay, thou art sure misled, O wise one, for my father hath not fought in any wars. Full many evenings as I lay abed, such tales I heard of him I never knew. A navigator on a freighter ship, which carried fragrant spices, hence to yon my father was. He kneweth not of wars. So hath thine uncle told thee, marry, he did not agree with aught thy father told of his philosophy and brave ideals. Thine uncle, tethered to the land, did not believe thy father should become involved in matters of the stars and empires. Nay, what shall I of the father tell the child? If gentle Luke knew all that's known to me, I'll warrant he'd not understand the rhyme and reason for my words. And yet, what is to lie? To tell the truth, all else be damned or else to tell perhaps a greater truth. Is it the truth to tell a boy each fact and thus deface his father's memory? Or have I spoken better truth to Luke? 
when I about his father speak with pride. Aye, every child deserves a champion. Hast thou done battle in the Clone Wars? Aye, and once was I a Jedi Knight, the same as thy dear father. Oh, how tears well up within me for the loss of that dear man, whom never I did know, nor do, nor will. I tell thee truly, amongst the pilots he was e'er the greatest in the galaxy. He also was a cunning warrior, and to the last was he a dear, dear friend. And now? to play upon his natural sense of self-importance, so to draw him near to thoughts of Jedi training for himself. I hear thou art a pilot skilled as well. This calleth to my mind a gift I have for thee. Thy father hath desired that thou should have this weapon when thou wert of age. Thine uncle, though, were none of it, so feared he that thou might have joined with Obi-Wan upon a fool's crusade, or devil's task, just as thy father hath when he was young. Uh, dear sir, if, if thou dost need me not, I shall shut down upon the present moment here. Why speaks he here when tis my time to speak? These droids of protocol are air uncouth, of etiquette they know but little truth. Pray tell, what is it? Thy father's lightsaber. It is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. If thou in thine own hand could hold a son, then thou wouldst know the power of this tool. Not merely random, neither awkward, like a blaster. Nay, the lightsaber maintains a noble elegance, a Jedi's pride. It is something for a civilized new age. Now holdeth Luke the weapon in his hand, and with a switch, the flame explodes in blue. The noble light Luke's reverence doth command. That instant was a Jedi born anew. Now doth the force begin to work in him. For many generations, Jedi were the guarantors of justice, peace, and good within the old republic. Ere the dark times came, and ere the Empire gan to reign. How hath my father died? O oh, question apt. The story whole I'll not reveal to him, yet may he one day understand my drift that from a certain point of view it may be said my answer is the honest truth. A Jedi named Darth Vader I, a lad whom I had taught until he evil turned, did help the Empire hunt and then destroy the Jedi. Now, the hardest words of all I'll utter here unto this innocent, with hope that one day he shall comprehend. He hath thy father murdered and betrayed, and now are Jedi nearly all extinct. Young Vader was seduced and taken by the dark side. The Force. The Force? The Force. The Force doth give a Jedi all his power, and tis a field of energy that doth surround and penetrate and bind all things together here within our galaxy. <laughs> and hearing this wise man, I have almost my errand quite forgot. Now, to my work. Beep, meep, meep, squee, beep, wee, squee, wee, so meep. And now, my little friend, shall I attempt to find out whence thou came and to discern the reason wherefore thou hast left thy home for lands unknown a mission to pursue? Uh, he hath a message played. I... Thus have I found. Dear General Kenobi, many years ago thou served my noble father in the Clone Wars. Now he beggeth thee to come again and aid him in his struggle with the Empire. Sadly, may I not be there in person my request to give. My ship of late hath fallen under siege, and thus my mission, bringing thee unto my cherished planet Alderaan, hath failed. Yet have I deep within the memory banks of this brave R2 unit stored the plans most vital for rebellion's victory. 
My father can retrieve the plans therein, but I must ask of thee to take the droid and bring him unto Alderaan with care. The desperate hour is now upon us. Please, I beg thee, sir. Oh, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, help. Thou art mine only hope. Exeunt. Act three, scene one. The Death Star. Enter Chorus, Vader, and Leia in Dumb Show. Now in her cell, the princess doth remain, with hope and trouble written on her face. At times she faces torture, horrid pain. With these tools, Vader seeks the rebel base. While Leia in her captive state is kept, young Luke and Obi-Wan set on their way. Approaching town, they hope to intercept a pilot to transport them sans delay. Moss Eisley on the desert planet Tatooine. Enter Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke Skywalker, C-3PO and R2-D2 riding in Landspeeder. Moss Eisley Spaceport. Never shall thou find a hive more rank and wretched, aye, and filled with villainy. So must we cautious be. Prithee, speak. Where hast thou these droids? It is three or mayhap four full seasons now. We are prepared to sell them, shouldst thou wish. Pray, show me now thy papers. Nay, thou dost not need to see his papers. Nay. We do not need to see his papers. True it is that these are not the droids for which thou searchest. Oh, these are not the droids for which we search. And now the lad may go his merry way. <coughs> Good lad, I prithee, go thy merry way. Exeunt. <laughs> Han Solo at thy service, gentlemen. The great Millennium Falcon is my ship. My first mate, Chewie, telleth me ye seek safe passage to the system, Alderaan. Aye, true. If tis a vessel swift of flight. A vessel swift of flight, thou sayest? Hast thou not heard of the Millennium Falcon, sir? Now shall he boast. But if his ship we'd have, some boasting we'll endure. Nay, should I have? Well, tis but the ship that hath the Kessel Run accomplished in twelve parsecs, nothing more. Imperial starships have I slyly scaped, but nothing more of that. And neither do I speak about boat cruisers, small but vast Corellian ships, yet nothing more, no more. I shall not brag about her speed, good sir. Suffice to say, the ship shall fill thy needs as she's the fastest ever, but nothing more. I nothing more. I wish he'd hold his peace. This man, it seems, doth love his ship far more than e'er I saw a man his woman love. Pray tell, what shall the cargo be? Myself, the boy, two droids, and ne'er a question asked. Tis what, a touch of local trouble here? Uh, nay, let us simply say thus we would imperial entanglements avoid. Aye, there's the rub. So shalt thou further pay. Ten thousand is the cost, and every bit shalt thou deliver ere we leave the dock. Ten thousand? Fie! We could our own ship buy for such a sum as this. A goodly jest! For who should pilot such a ship? Shouldst thou? Thou knave! I could indeed! A pilot skilled am I in my own right! Now should we stay and be abused more by this man's words? Two thousand can we render to thee now, and fifteen more deliver when we come with safety unto Alderaan's bright port. Say seventeen. Congratulations, man. Thou hast a ship secured and will depart whenever thou art prepared. Thou shalt find me at docking number ninety-four. Aye, ninety-four. It seemeth that thou may have already provoked some interest. 
17. So must they desperate be. This truly may my swift deliverance prove. Go unto the ship and be prepared. In times past, I have poor judgments made, and now these errors plague my very soul. For freedom I was made, for taking wing, yet as a marked man, I cannot fly. For bound by debts, by duty, and by fear, I live my life along the razor's edge. One part of me that hunts for better life, and one part hunted for the life I've led. My own existence is a paradox, a smuggler with a lover's kindly heart, a gambler with a noble spirit brave. I would be better than it seems I am if I transcend the man I was. Perhaps this new employment shall reveal the way I shall make straight my crooked path, thus heal my past and write a future new. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 4. Inside the Death Star. Enter Han Solo and Chewbacca, with stormtroopers entering and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia aside. Enter Chorus. With hardy blast, the Imperial troops appear. Their coming doth require that Han retreat in moment dangerous amidst great fear. Here Han and Leia for the first time meet. Our exit's blocked now. And with a fool's great skill hast thou our route to freedom quite cut off. Mayhap the Highness would prefer herself. C-3PO, canst thou by any means discover how we made the cell block leave? Our entry point is now a deadly end. All to thy presence have alerted been. The entrance only takes one in or out. All other information where thou art hath been restricted. Go! Oh. Now are we quite trapped? I cannot hold them back forever, sure. Tis quite a rescue thou hast planned for me. Thou hast come in, but how shalt thou go out? Hath folly been thy guide? He hath the plan, not I, thou sweetheart of ingratitude. <laughs> By what dark sprite of hell art thou possessed? Well, it falls to me to make our rescue good. Now follow me into the refuse heap. <gasps> Go thou, hence. Oh, get in, thou furry lump. I care not what thou smellst within, unless his death must be a sweeter smell than this attack. Now go, be not afeard, my friend. I say what charming girl thou here has found. I either shall destroy her, or perhaps I may in time begin to like the wench. Nay, executioner or lover, both are far too great a role for thee to play. Now go and follow I, else be damned. The scene doth shift unto the refuse space, where all is rot as like a funeral pyre. Though safe our heroes other woes now face, they go from frying pan into the fire. Oh, what wonder if the human mind hath wrought to bring us here. Your highness must be lauded greatly for discovering such a wondrous smell as this. I'll blast the door, swift and the end. Nay, pretty, shoot thou not! <laughs> Baron Knave, wouldst thou undo us all? I have already tried to exit thus, but lo, it's thou now plainly seized, thou brute, the passageway is sealed magnetically! Now rid us of that blaster quickly too, else shall thine edgy trigger finger mean the certain death for all of us herein. Oh, aye, thy worship. Ha! T'was all in my control till thou didst lead us to this heap, nor shall the stormtroopers need any time to calculate where all of us have flown. And yet, I say to you, it could be worse. Tis worse. I warrant something lives in here. 
I expect his word is true, but fear to say. <laughs> Tis but thy keen imagination, Luke. Twas not just my imagination that hath now swum boldly past my leg, or else imagination now hath body too. Ay, there, did thine eyes see? Did but a mere imagined figment just swim by? See what? Oh! Yet, yet ere young Luke with answer can respond, he's pulled into the watery depths below. For several moments in that garbage pond, no sign is seen beneath the murky flow. An ominous sound breaks forth into the pit, and seconds later, Luke emerges. Then, the beast's pursuit of him for now is quick. A greater challenge doth this represent. Oh, miracle that thou art truly saved. What happened there below the briny sludge? I do not know. The slimy creature hath released its vice-like grip on me and fled. I have a feeling bad about this sound. The walls! Oh, horrid fate, begin to move! Oh, be not afeard, and stand thou not in awe, but rouse thee now, and halt its sure approach. Now lend me thy assistance! <laughs> oh, but wait! I have a comlink, and may hail the droids! Get C-3PO, say, art thou there? Pray! Speak! Fear not, our heroes shall not meet their end. But on to other scenes our tale must go. We cannot hold you here forever, friends. Thus two acts four, scene seven precedes the show. Behold, as Leia, Han, and Luke look on, whilst Obi-Wan and Vader take the stage. Toward deep resentment are the two men drawn, which only this last duel shall assuage. Act four, scene seven, inside the Death Star. Enter Darth Vader. For certain, I have waited, Obi-Wan. And now Obi -Wan at last Kenobi we meet with stormtroopers together. watching. For certain I have waited, Obi-Wan, and now at last we meet together here. Our destinies, once and for all, fulfilled. The circle of our lives is now complete. A student was I when I left thee last, but now I am the master over thee. Thou art a master, Darth, I know it is true, but only evil hast thou mastered yet. Time, thy powers have weak become, old man. And yet, Thou canst not win, I'll warrant, Darth. For if thou strike me down, e'en now, e'en here, I shall more great and powerful become than e'er thou hast imagined possible. I tell thee plain, thou shouldst not have returned. What noble battle passes twixt these men! Lightsabers rage from Sith and Jedi Knight! No more courageous battle hath there been, is like the day does combat with the night. Now whilst the two in conflict strike their blows, the others come that they the ship may find. At first Han Solo with Chewbacca shows, then Luke and Princess Leia just behind. Did we not just this frightening party leave? <laughs> Where hast thou been? And we did some old friends meet, but finding them unfriendly have both vowed to find far truer, better friends henceforth. Hast thou seen any problems with the ship? It seemeth fine if we may make approach and get beyond the stormtroopers. 
I, then my fondest hope is that thine Obi-Wan hath vanquished that wicked tractor beam. Oh, behold what is, the stormtroopers go hence. Now tis our chance. Good R2-D2, come. I, will he lead me now? Squeak beep. Fly, fly, good friends, unto the ship make haste. As everyone unto the ship draws nigh, young Luke sees Obi-Wan trade slice with slice. And Ben Kenobi, catching young Luke's eye, prepares to make a gracious sacrifice. A Jedi is not made of fear or hate, but must a nobler countenance display. It is a lesson learned in times gone by that still I teach myself unto this day. Full many years I've spent with thoughts of this, this instant when Darth Vader I'd confront. But now my thirst for retribution's cold, while sweet forgiveness doth my spirit taste. I know I cannot win this battle here, nor would I wish to slay the kindly man who surely still within this black shell lives. And so, unto this death I'll go, this sleep, this sleep that promises the dream of peace, this undiscovered galaxy wherein I'll know at last tranquility of heart. But ere I die, I shall one last lesson teach, I shall in this my final moment set a keen example for the universe that future generations may yet know the valor and the strength of Jedi Knights. Put up thy lightsaber now, Obi-Wan, and show thyself a Jedi to this son. The cry of Nay! escapes Luke's trembling lip, and stormtroopers turn round to see them there. A battle break begins before the ship, as to the falcon these brave souls repair. But ere the group departs amid the fray, Luke hears the voice of Obi-Wan inside. Ray, run, Luke, run. The inner voice doth say, and Luke the Death Star leaves with force as guide. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 5, The Death Star Trench. Enter Chorus. Ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, Tarkin, R2-D2, Imperial Pilots. Luke's ship comes closer to the little port while Vader and his crew draw all too near. Young Luke to his computer doth resort until he hears the voice speak in his ear. Oh, use the force, dear Luke. Let go and trust. The hearing of these words is like a bomb unto my soul. So shall I trust the force and not this fallible computer here. What is this, Luke? Thy targeting machine hath been turned off. What can be wrong? Pray tell. Nay, all is well. Fear not, good friends. Deep squeak. <laughs> Small R2-D2 oh. has been lost. The Death Star now has come within our range. Commander, thou may spire when thou hast made all goodly preparation thereunto. Now face thy death, thou rebel. Sir, take heed. Now, in a trice, Brave Han is on the scene. The smuggler hath returned on errand kind. With sly approach, he makes his way unseen and slays the Imperial pilots from behind. But how? Thy path is clear, young Luke. Now do thy deed and let us make all way back home. I stretch my feelings out and use the force. And on the instant seems the porthole vast, not small or difficult to strike, but large. The ship is armed, and now I take the chance. 
the blast away, and with it all our hopes! The laser hits its mark with such an aim, and as the Death Star arms to strike the base, the chain reaction sets the orb aflame. The Death Star has exploded into space! Thy timely blast hath hit the perfect mark! One in a million was thy force-filled shot! Remember me, O oh Luke. Remember me. And ever shall the force remain with thee. Now dawns a new day with the Son of Peace. The day whereon the rebels welcome fate, and from their enemies they find release, and now with mirth they come to celebrate. Young Luke, strong in the force, doth walk beside the noble Han, whose valor won the day. The rebels form an aisle and rise with pride, as Luke and Han march forth in grand display. Now Leia smiles and gives them their reward, as each bows low with hope and joy sincere. C-3PO and R2, now restored. Look on as brave Chewbacca sounds the cheer. Oh, hooray! Oh, hooray! Oh, hooray. Oh, hooray. Oh, hooray! There let our heroes rest, free from attack, till darkness rise and empire striketh back. Exeunt omnes. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, excerpts from Shakespeare's Star Wars. Please give yourselves a massive round of applause. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. That was an absolute thrill ride from start to finish. Thank you so much, everyone. What a fantastic show. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, our audience watching, uh, I hope you had a great time, we certainly did, uh, to our wonderful uh, cast and crew this evening, starting as always with our tireless producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I am an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate stage manager and master of most spectacular props, Emily Ingram. Hi, my name's Emily Ingram. I'm a director, stage manager and producer based in Edinburgh. Our very own Elizabethan John Williams, it's Adam Woodhams. Hi, I'm Adam Woodhams, a sound designer based in the UK. And finally, resident fight directors, stunt people, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader with light rapiers, it's Yarrett Dorr and Enrique Ortuño. Hi, my name is Yarrett. And I'm Enrique. And we're fight directors based in London. Wonderful. And now for our cast, which has been put together by the incredible casting director, Sydney Aldridge, as Luke Skywalker, Elliot Bourneman. Hello, I am Elliot Borneman, an actor from London, and I just want to say, may the fourth be with you. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Bill Bingham. Yes, here I am sitting, wishing that uh, Alec Guinness was whispering in my ear in Islington in North London. Good evening. <laughs> As C-3PO, Dominic Brewer. Hello, I'm Dominic Brewer. I was playing 3PO. I'm, in, I'm uh, from London, uh, currently isolating in Chester. Hello, everyone. As R2-D2, Eugenia Lowe. Hi, I'm Eugenia Lowe. I'm an actor based in London. As Leia Organa, Tiffany Abercrombie. Hi, I'm Tiffany Abercrombie. I'm a New York City-based semi-retired actor. <laughs> As Han Solo, Sam Benjamin. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Benjamin. I've been your Han Solo. I'm a professional actor, currently in London, originally from Merseyside. As Chewbacca, Stephen Leesk. Hi, I'm Stephen. I was playing Chewbacca, and uh, I'm from London. As Darth Vader, Miguel Perez. I am Miguel, and I'm an actor who works out of Los Angeles, California. And the members of our Valiant Ensemble this evening, first of all, Ramona Von Push. Hi, I'm Ramona Von Push. I'm an Australian-German actress based in London. <laughs> David Jamal. 
Hi everyone, my name is David Jamal. I'm an actor and theatre maker, originally from Jerusalem, now based in London. Karina Brown. Hi guys, I'm Karina Brown. I am an actor based in London. And Ruth Page. I'm Ruth Page and I am a Midlands born and based actor. Wonderful. And finally, our valiant swing for this evening, who in the event of technical difficulties would have jumped in, but instead of technical difficulties was jumping in as rebels and jumping he was, it's Clark Alexander. Swing squadron standing by. I'm Clark Alexander and I'm a Scottish actor based in London. Amazing. Thank you so much. And fantastic job to each and every single one of you. you brought me so much joy through that last 40 minutes. I'm sure that's the same for our audience as well. And at this time, we'd love to invite questions from our live audience, in particular for Ian, to discuss his amazing work. But if you have any questions for the cast and crew as well, please feel free to send them along. How are we doing, everybody? How are we feeling after that? Oh, OK. <laughs> my my good knees good. hurt. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm loving wearing a ruff. I think I might wear this every day. <laughs> I've got right, to say, yeah, I made a ruff for the occasion and I feel like I'll never go back now. <laughs> <laughs> once, you, once you go there, you never come back. <laughs> oh, I actually need wonderful. to take mine off. <laughs> yes, I think I might take mine off too, actually. <laughs> I, might, I think I might collapse. And thank you, Rob, for making it happen. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you, in fact, to Ian Desher for making it happen. These are his Thank you, I've got uh, my, my copy here. Remember, if you buy these from the uh, quirkbooks.biz shop, 30% of the proceeds go to the show must go online. And all of our proceeds are distributed equally between the actors who take part, who choose to opt in to our uh, hardship fund. So please do uh, consider getting one of these. They are absolutely phenomenal. I love them. Everybody involved loves them. Uh, Ian. Do you want to talk a little bit about the genesis of this idea? What 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 was the flash of inspiration that led to this uh, thing that's now obviously you've done? Have you done all nine of these now? I believe I have done all nine of these. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, it was about uh, eight years ago that I uh, got together with some friends of mine from high school and we watched the Star Wars trilogy together. And then right after that, I read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, uh, one of the first popular mashup books. Uh, and then just after that, went to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I'm um, based in Portland in the States. And so uh, I went to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival with Star Wars and mashups bouncing around in my head. Uh, and it was while I was there at this festival that I, I thought it'd be really fun to take Star Wars and rewrite it as though it were a play by Shakespeare. Um, and so I ended up, I looked up Quirk Books online because Quirk Books had published Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. And I knew they had done some other mashups as well. Uh, and uh wrote to their editor, introduced myself, said, I haven't written a book before or published a book before, here's, but here's an idea for you. Um, and so uh, he wrote back and said, if you actually write something, let me know and I'll take a look at it. And that was enough uh, interest for me to sit down and start writing. Uh, so I wrote the first act of the book, uh, which I sent off to him, which he liked. And then he sent off to Lucasfilm and they came back and said, well, we like what he's doing so far, but we want to see if he can have more fun with it. Sort of, you know, if you're going to do this idea, might as, go, might as well go all the way uh, with it. And so that's when I revised the first couple of scenes and introduced R2-D2 speaking in English in his asides to the audience, uh, her asides to the audience, as I should say, um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, then we were sort of off and running. And uh, the first book came out in 2013, and The Merry Rise of Skywalker will come out this July. Amazing, amazing. I absolutely can't wait for that. Can't wait to see how you interpret that particular piece. Um, so we've got here um, a couple of questions coming in from our audience. This one's from Sam Murray. Do you have any plans of adapting any other series into iambic pentameter? So I have done uh, Mean Girls and Back to the Future and Clueless, uh, all of which the, those Mean Girls and Back to the Future came out a year ago and Clueless uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, look for further announcements. So the show must go online. Uh, we will be doing performances of, of some of those as well. Um, and so uh, I, there are always ideas about, well, what, what might you do next? Um, the one that I really would love to get my hands into is The Princess Bride, but we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. Oh, mate, you, you're, really, you're really getting my, uh, 
my tongue salivating there for that one. I would love uh, love to see your treatment of Princess Bride. Fantastic. Uh, we've also got a couple more here. Someone's asked, uh, have all of these plays ever been performed in full? No. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the, the way the licensing works, uh, all of the rights for the uh, book, for this book in particular, belong to Lucasfilm and therefore Disney. Um, and so they license uh, whatever they want to uh, in terms of performances or audiobooks or that kind of thing. So we there have been audiobooks for some of the uh, some of my books. Um, they are allowing us to do this today, uh, which is marvelous because uh, in general they have been uh, they have not wanted to license this for performance. Um, and so uh, we are are lucky to get to do this today. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been really fun to see it happen. It's been a wonderful honour and a privilege, and also an honour and a privilege to have yourself as the chorus as well. A fantastic uh, job there, Ian, from the costuming to the walking backwards up the stairs to the energy that you were bringing <laughs> to setting up every scene. It was really fantastic stuff. So it was wonderful to actually have you as a part of the show, not only as a part of the broader show as a whole. So thank you so much for your willingness to get involved. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, we Someone's asked, how much rehearsal did you have to deliver this? The answer to that is, uh, pretty much a day and a half uh, so really not much time at all uh, we've also had here and this is perhaps a question for Emily Ingram what was the hardest prop or costume piece to work out? Um, I would say um, the Death Star actually um, working out how we were going to do the Death Star whether we were going to add um, a post-production effect um, whether Rob was going to add in an explosion or whether we were going to do that all live and um, while um, these guys were rehearsing, I was painting uh, the balloon to look like Death Star. I was packing it with uh, confetti and tissue paper. And I was getting instructions uh, over the group chat that I, I have with Rob and Sarah about, you know, oh, can we add this? Can we add that? I was going, folks, we're losing the light. We're losing the light. And I knew I had one take to do it. Otherwise, I'd have to start the process all over again. So I think that was the most tense prop I made for the show and actually possibly have ever made. Um, <laughs> But the effect seems to work. Um, certainly when we first showed it to the cast, they really seemed to enjoy it. It was a triumph. Thank you so much. But really, you know, um, props to this show have been a joy to do because the cast has been, um, you know, so, so willing to um, experiment, to try things out. Uh, Ruth Page deserves a shout out, uh, actually, for uh, the cockpit uh, setup that she did for the fighters. Ruth, would you be willing to show people uh, exactly how that works? Yeah, um, so this was one of those like middle of the night ideas that I had and I just kind of made it and brought it in and the team just went, yes, whatever you're doing, yes. Um, so this is what it actually looks like. So it's just a bookend, a P an A4 piece of card cut out to look like the window frame because Rob mentioned about how iconic the windows look for all the different um, battle battleships, I suppose. Um, and then just some tape and a couple of lollipop sticks there you go. So when it's perfectly placed onto the front there, I'm in a ship. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. You're Thank you so much for that. that. For future show must go online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Next time we need a tie fighter, we'll, fight. we'll be right in there. Um, Emily, I just want to say as well, uh, I think it's, it's really... Um, you know, uh, true to the ethos of the original Star Wars films as well, that we did the Death Star using practical effects. So I think rather than uh, trying to, you know, go the CGI route, we were in all uh, original trilogy mode. And so we took an original trilogy approach. I think that's absolutely fab. Absolutely. And, and you and I had a conversation during the um, research and development period. I say research and development period is about a two hour Zoom call. Where, um, <laughs> you know, me, Rob, Sarah, uh, Yarrett and Enrique and Adam sat down and went, oh my gosh, how do we make this work? But during the research and development period, um, you know, Rob and I were saying the best sci-fi is made with no budget. You, know, you look at, um, yeah, early Star Wars is the perfect example. It, having no budget and no time forces you to be creative um, and forces you to just get on and, and, and do it. Um, and, and that's actually been you know, a, a joy for this project, you know, just having to go, right, we've got a balloon, we've got, we're losing the light, we've got a Sharpie, let's go. Um, <laughs> we'll be uh, posting up uh, on our Patreon page, I, I think, um, the aftermath of that explosion. If anyone would like to see the chaos um, that that caused in my flat and, and sort of laugh with me or at me, uh, that will be going live in the next few days. 
Wonderful. Yes, I'm really looking forward to uh, really looking forward to sharing some more behind the scenes stuff on our Patreon page as well. So if you would like to uh, support the actors that take part, uh, we would lovely to have you. Uh, and uh, please do consider joining our Patreon page. That will be most wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, got a couple more uh, questions here from our audience. Got one for Ian. Ian, can you hear me? I, am I coming through loud and clear? Wonderful. Uh, so yep. uh, got a question here. What is your favourite Star Wars memory oh i mean my favorite star wars memory now is because of these books um and so it has to be at uh comic con in i think it was 2014 or 2015 maybe 2016 anyway uh ian mcdermid uh who played emperor palpatine was doing a panel and they asked him you know as a star wars fan what are your what's what, what merchandise do you like and he said well I, I rather like those shakespeare star wars books uh, and they must have known that he was going to say that because they pulled out uh, the Jedi Death Return and they gave it to him. And he then read a speech from Palpatine, uh, you know, on the stage at, at Star Wars Celebration. Uh, and that, you know, I mean, you can't you can't beat that. It was fantastic. It was amazing. That is a lifetime high, that, I can imagine. Oh, my word, I wish I was there. That sounds incredible. Uh, got one here. What were the lightsaber props made from? Yara and Enrique. Um. Yeah, um, uh, there are some um, actual rapiers that we uh, attach some glow sticks. So the glow sticks that you use to go parting and you break and then they glow. Uh, so we had like a hundred red glow sticks and a hundred blue glow sticks and we just attach them with cello tape to, uh, to an actual rapier and hope that they glow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how it goes. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I asked... spent, oh, sorry, I go spent four hours making this goddamn <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. So it's someone's asked here. Amazing. Someone's asked here. I need to get some of your books. Where can I get them? Uh, you can get them anywhere. Um, maybe especially during this time from your local independent bookseller um, who probably needs your business right now. Um, but you can also go to quirkbooks.biz right now. B I Z. Um, and find them uh, right now. And as Rob mentioned, some of those proceeds today go to uh, support The Show Must Go Online as well. Um, and so uh, there, are, there are many ways to find them. They're out there. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'm prepared, you, you can always lend mine if you want to. <laughs> I'm prepared to sell this to a viewer <laughs> towards the funds. For us, I don't care how much. Any proceeds to this, I will post it to them and they will give the money to the show must go online. Amazing, I, amazing. I'm, keep, I'm keeping mine, That's, this oh, is well. too precious. <laughs> <laughs> Good as yours. So there's one original light rapier hilt made from cardboard and tinfoil up for grabs. If you'd like it, you can contact me at Rob Miles on Twitter, uh, get in touch and let us know what your bids are. We'll see what that comes out at. That'll be a fun little one to do. Uh, we've also got here a couple more questions. Um, what, were there any aspects of Shakespearean acting that you found useful in performing Star Wars? Is that open to all of us? That's open, yeah. I want to congratulate Ian on getting his pentameters just perfect. And, and as you know, pentameters, the ambic nature of them helps you emphasize and make sense of what the stories are. And he did it. He did it with the I mean, Star Wars story. It's extraordinary. Ian, congratulations. Thank you. I think off, off the back of that as well, um, like the way Ian has channeled the Shakespeare through it as an actor, it really, it's a reminder with any Shakespeare and as with Ian's words here, is that sometimes when you're in a bit of a pinch or you're, you know, obviously we prepared this very quickly, um, but then you always go back to the Shakespeare principle of all the keys and all the magic are, is in the words. So ride the words, explore the words, feel the words in your mouth, and then gradually the characters start to form more and more and more. So it's, it's brilliant, works just like Shakespeare. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we've got one here uh, for Steve Purcell, our guest introducer. Yes, as uh, Emily Beach has asked, <laughs> first, firstly said, pantaloons big ups, and secondly has said, um, what, are, uh, what are the connections that you see between Shakespeare and Star Wars? 
Oh gosh, okay. Well, I mean, um, I outlined the main ones in my introduction. Um, I think what, uh, something that Ian talks about in uh, his book actually is that George Lucas, when he was writing Star Wars, was quite consciously borrowing from archetypal myths. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and obviously Shakespeare's working with that kind of mythical material too. So uh, especially, I think that's why to me, it feels like there's more of um, Shakespeare in, uh, sorry, there's more of Star Wars in the early history plays and in the late romances than there is in the tragedies and comedies for, for me, um, because those, those plays are the ones that tend to draw on that, those kind of mythical structures. Comedy and tragedy each have their own generic structures, which isn't really what George Lucas is doing in uh, in these films although of course there are elements you know there's there's um, sure. especially in the prequel trilogy you get you get elements of a kind of tragedy of Anakin Skywalker yeah um, Ian I'm interested to get your take on this because it's fascinating to hear Steve kind of interpret these uh but then we've got you here so we can get it from the horse's mouth so I'm just interested to know uh as as someone uh, from the outside looking in has kind of found these things in there were those your influences when you were when you were creating this I was just sitting here thinking how nice it was that Steve got to answer the question this time instead of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be brief um, if you I want. Mean, yeah, it, certainly, I, I mean, I've always thought that there are themes throughout Star Wars that are so similar to the themes throughout Shakespeare, right? Um, whether it's young people who are looking for their destinies or uh, good versus evil or these larger than life villains. Uh, whatever it is. And certainly, uh, yes, when you get into the prequels, this this tragic fall of Anakin Skywalker becoming Darth Vader um, and uh, and and similarly, in some ways, the arc that Kylo Ren has uh, in the sequel trilogy. So, um, there, you know, I think all good stories share uh, common themes of one kind or another. Uh, and so it's no surprise that you're finding them in Shakespeare and in Star Wars as well. Absolutely. And just directing it, I remember saying to uh, Sam when he was playing Han and he had that soliloquy that to me it put me in mind of uh, Hal in Henry IV Part One, uh, And he has that speech about, uh, you know, when uh, I'll, I'll permit the, uh, the base contagious clouds and all that kind of stuff to, to wash me over for a while so that when I break through, I'll look even better by comparison. To me, there was a real flavour of that in Han's soliloquy, uh, even though he wasn't deliberately obviously choosing this baser life, he was nevertheless trying to break out of it. And so, you know, you know, I, I really find that there were quite rich parallels in there with uh, Shakespearean character archetypes as well. Um, uh, got a couple of questions here. I'm going to uh, try and get through them as quickly as possible. How do you cast the characters? Uh, our amazing uh, casting director, Sydney Aldridge, uh, cast the characters. Uh, you, if you want to, can take part in The Show Must Go Online as well. Please go to robmiles.co.uk forward slash The Show Must Go Online and click the Take Part button to do your sign-up form. You'll then receive updates every week on how you can take part in the shows. Uh, we've got a question here for C-3PO. How many times have you watched Star Wars? You were so amazing as C-3PO. <laughs> Uh, how long's a piece of string? I, I I don't know. How many times have I watched Star Wars? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, a lot. Um, but then Anthony Daniels does such an iconic job that when you when you hear what he does, you can't help but emulate it. Uh, and in fact, so many of those performances in the original trilogy are, are iconic. You know, the way the way those lines are spoken ring out. You, you can't you can't hear them any other way. So um, it, it's a funny one, really, because because I, I'd never, I'd never imagined myself as a 3PO. And, and Rob said to me, hmm, you, what do you think about 3PO? You might want to submit yourself. And I was like, oh, oh, maybe. And there it was. I mean, um, thank you, Rob. <laughs> an absolute pleasure mate an absolute pleasure thank you and al although you don't need it go onto our twitter and check out dom's uh, hype video for tonight because it is a thing of absolute beauty there's 8080 puppetry in there as well uh, i've got a double whammy of quick ones for you here ian uh, uh dornish vintage would like to hear your take on you scruffy looking nerf herder first of all oh boy uh i mean you're gonna have to Give me a second. Ask me the second question. And by the time, uh, by the yeah. time I'm ready yeah. to answer that one, yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, they're very closely related. The other one is: Does Ian have a handy list of Shakespearean insults? So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave those with you, and I'll answer another question, which is the most popular question from the chat this evening. 
Uh, and uh, oh, we're getting some wonderful pictures from our actors in the chat as well of, of what a scruffy looking her nerf herder might look like in iambic pentameter. Uh, but the most commonly asked question from uh, this evening's performance was, how did you do the layer hologram? And I am pleased to be able to tell you that it's just an innate ability that Tiffany Abercrombie, our actor, has, and she was cast <laughs> solely for that reason. She has this ability to weirdly go blue and semi-translucent. Uh, and so, of course, a little bit like when you need an actor musician, you need to cast the people that have got the skills, right? So luckily for us, Tiffany, you put that on her form. She said, by the way, I can go translucent and blue. So we're like, great, you're in. my special skills. That's, that's, yes, uh, exactly. That's why I'm, she's... Uh, uh, that's why she's a semi-retired actress because uh, she now also works for Space Force. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. The phasing in and out uh, sometimes can happen involuntarily. So <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. But no, uh, Tif Tiffany is a phenomenal actress, and uh, we are going to preserve the magic of certain of our tricks here at the show. As go online, I hope you'll uh, respect that. And of course, we are always trying to push the boundaries of the format. And I really feel like Star Wars was the right way uh, to push that to its extreme. So uh, now you've had a little bit of time to think about it, Ian. What what uh, might your pictures be? So I have my, uh, I do have a re website that I use often for, that sort of has a catalog of Shakespearean insults. So I often do go there when I'm looking for insults. Um, I will say that Leia's line in The Empire Striketh Back is uh, when, when Han says, uh, you didn't see us in the passage south where she did to, unto me unspool in full her feelings true of fondest love for me. And Leia responds with, my feelings, oh, thou arrogant halfwit. Thou oversized child, thou friend of slime, thou man of scruffy looks, thou who hurts nerfs, thou full-born, wimpled, rough-hewn waste of flesh. So, that's Amazing. How I, that's how Amazing. And that puts me in mind of another classic uh, Shakespearean uh, accumulation, which is by Hal against Falstaff, where he calls him about 20 different uh, <laughs> insults in a row. So if you haven't seen that one, if you're new to Shakespeare, I highly recommend you check that out if you're looking for Shakespearean insults. Um, we've got I, I here. Have in, I have to throw in Han's response because it's right here. Go like for it. Scruffy. Scruffy how? Who's scruffiness? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my old scruffed. <laughs> Wonderful. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and we've got a pitch here from uh, from Emily Ingram, our Master of Props, uh, who has said, Marry, thou art a nerf herding violet, yay, in guise most scruffy and vile, which uh, I enjoy a great deal as well. Wonderful, wonderful. I, Thank you so Ian's much. Ian's was definitely better, though. Let's, let's be clear. Ian's He's had better. more practice, to be fair. <laughs> he is a, 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 an old pro at this by this point. Um, uh, so, da, 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 sorry, just going through the, uh, the remainder of our questions. Not many more to go now, so we've probably got time for two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, so we have here, uh, how did you rehearse? The answer is exactly how we perform. We all get together on Zoom uh, and we are big fans of pitching. Uh, and so we will talk about some of our initial ideas for a set piece or a moment. Uh, and then we'll ask the actors to have better ideas than that. And frequently they do. Uh, and I think a great example of that was uh, Stephen Leask's trash compactor mattress, which he bravely dragged across the length of the room. <laughs> Which looked like pretty hard work. Uh, pretty this, hard work. This was like the first mattress I ever bought, right? So it's old and it's heavy and it's full of all types of like dirt. So, <laughs> and it's just been living in this room for about eight months. And uh, yeah, why didn't just do some casual lifting of a mattress? Idiot. <laughs> yeah. But it was too good an idea not to put in once you'd suggested it. So yes. Certainly, uh, certainly made your own bed there. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, <laughs> so we've, uh, yeah, we've done the lightsaber props. Uh, how do you cast the actors? We've touched on that. Uh, do you have Shakespearean insults? We've touched on that. So I think we've covered off most of our audience questions at this point. And so for that reason, I would like to bid you all a very good night a happy Star Wars day. I hope that you have a marvelous time and please consider joining us at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles on Wednesday for the Comedy of Errors. Thank you so much everyone uh, for coming to watch the show today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope if you've never heard Shakespeare before, this might give you uh, an inkling as to what all the fun is about and we hope you'll come and discover more with the show must go online. Thank you so much to Ian Desha for creating these incredible pieces of work. Thank you so much as well for asking us 
listeners reaching out and asking us to get involved in this. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you to Quirk Books, who have been so incredible in uh, managing and organising this live stream and, and doing all the rights and all that kind of thing, getting the rights to do this piece. Um, you know what? I'm going to do a kind of Springer's final thought. I'm going to end on an anecdote. So how's about that? Uh, I became uh, an actor and director and storyteller largely because of Star Wars. I grew up in a deprived working class area uh, with a quite sheltered existence. And when I saw Star Wars for the first time at Christmas, uh, it, I walked into the middle of Empire Strikes Back and it was Yoda. And it blew my tiny mind <laughs> that there was more diversity in a single frame of Star Wars than I'd experienced in my entire life up to that point. It blew my mind that you could have action and adventure and deep philosophy and heroes could uh, leave their hometowns, their desert planets, <laughs> and they could get out and they could go on these fantastic adventures and, and see all these incredible things. Uh, and so it is the reason that I am here today. It's the reason that I later fell in love with Star Wars for all the reasons that Steve Purcell so uh, accurately enunciated in his intro. Uh, and so to be able to put the two together today in this way with this incredible cast, thanks to Ian, thanks to Quirk, has been uh, the honour and privilege of my life. So uh, a, a genuine, genuine thank you from me uh, for getting me involved as much as everyone else. Uh, and so we'd now like to wish you a very good evening. Thank you for uh, coming. Follow us and Quirk Books on social to sign up for uh, Clueless next week. That's right, you could be a part of the cast for Clueless next week if you go to robmiles.co.uk forward slash the show must go online and sign up. Uh, the sign up is open until Wednesday morning. I believe. Uh, and so you've got time to sign up. But yes, we're doing Taming of the Clueless next week. Hugely exciting times. Uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button on this very YouTube channel right here. And now before you leave, like the video and make sure that you tune in next week for Taming of the Clueless. Thank you so much and a very good night to you all. May the fourth be with you. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs>